So uh, I, I have, um, I took the liberty this morning of, uh, of shifting the schedule just slightly to give us a little bit of time here in the morning because I realized there's no way everyone would be here settled with their coffee by uh, right by 9 to start. So we're going to start the first panel at 9.10. Uh, and what I, what I did to compensate is I did take five minutes out of the passing time between the first and second panel. So 10 instead of 15 minutes. I know that's a hardship. I apologize. Um, and I took five minutes out of lunch, which is maybe the real hardship. But that'll, that'll get us back on, on schedule. Um, I just wanted to say just a few very quick words. There are some folks that weren't uh, here yesterday. Um, and I just want to make sure that everyone knows a few things. Uh, the first of which, to remind you, our hashtag, uh, if you are on Twitter, this is how you can tweet about the conference. We are, again, live streaming the conference at that address right there. Will you have videos of the talks later, or was it just live? Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, we will have videos later. I don't know exactly when, but on the conference website and probably also on the Rare Book School uh, website, uh, although we're still working out some of those details. Um, this is a mistake. I didn't actually mean to pull this up again, but uh, I left the slide in from yesterday, so there it is. Rare Book School Fellowship, Mellon Fellowship. If you're interested, talk to me or Ray Lynn. Uh, I got a text from Ray Lynn, my co-organizer, just a few minutes ago saying that she's been stuck on the train for 40 minutes due to a medical emergency. So uh, it is possible that others coming from Cambridge might be on that same train. Um, I hope not too many, but um, hopefully she'll be here soon. I wanted to remind everyone of our goals. You all saw these yesterday, our two goals. <laughs> I also just wanted to remind you about our, our sponsors, so the Rare Book School, the uh, New Lab for Text Maps and Networks, the Northeastern Humanities Center, and the American Antiquarian Society. I would encourage those of you who are tweeting to thank all those people profusely on Twitter if you have enjoyed these past few days. And then to think about the schedule and the working groups. Um, taking all of the suggestions that you made yesterday, and a few of you added suggestions overnight, I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried to sort of bring those into some kind of form. Uh, and I put them on the schedule. Um, I, I tried to organize them around questions. And actually, if you look at the, if you look at the schedule, I'll pull it up right here. I have it pulled up. you look at them, I've tried to organize them around the questions that we were asking because I actually think this is what this is how we want to start the working groups, right? What are the shared questions that we want to talk through uh, with each other? If you see something you know horribly wrong here, I have you know unfairly represented uh, your your ideas, something of that nature, or I've missed something that I just cannot miss. Let me know. Um, these are uh, some of them a little cheeky. I apologize. I was just uh, trying to sort of maintain the, the vibe that we had yesterday, which was lovely and wonderful. Um, and for those of you who have not attended sort of an unconference before, you're unfamiliar with the format, uh, one of the things that Amanda French would always say at the beginning of, a, of that <coughs> camp is that we, we follow the rule of two feet, right? Which is to say, if you go to a, a session because you think it's the one that you want to be in and you find after 10 minutes that it's, it's just not kind of your thing, by all means, you know, get up, go to a different session. This is fine. No one there should be offended that this is happening. Uh, we really want these to be productive sessions for the people who are in them. So make, make that true. The other thing that I would ask, someone yesterday asked about recording. We, we don't have the facilities to record all of these sessions. There are just too many of them. Uh, we don't have that much, quite that much of a budget. Um, what I would ask is, is similar to what, what happens at that camp. If someone in every room can take someone or multiple people in every room can take responsibility for taking notes uh, and then give me the the links to the notes and I'll make sure that those get onto the conference website so that people can peruse the notes from sessions that they weren't able to attend um, often a great way to do this if you're comfortable with it is to start a new Google document and have everyone in the session sort of log in and as the sessions ongoing to sort of take notes on the fly uh, that way no one person gets uh, shoulders that burden entirely, and you get really robust, good notes about what went on in the session. So I would just ask everyone to, to, to do that. And, and if you have suggestions about this, just let me know during the day. And that gets us right to 9.10. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Oh, good question. So as far as uh, where these places are, Curry is uh, where we had the um, reception. 
uh, last night. So the student center, go out of the front doors of the library, veer to the right, and you'll see the Curry Student Center to your right. It's, it's immediately there. Uh, and then these rooms would be, you would go kind of like you were going to the ballroom, but you'd go up to the third floor in that building. The, the other maybe slightly confusing one is the L Hall Frost Lounge. Uh, L Hall is actually, if you just sort of kept going, it's, it, it joins Curry. It's just a little bit further down that, that path. And actually, you can get to L Hall through the art gallery in Curry. You sort of walk through the, if you want to see the art gallery, you can walk through the art gallery and you'll end up in L Hall. So it's, it's very easy to get there. Or uh, I would ask again, Northeastern folks, identify yourselves. Find one of these people <laughs> and, and ask them where to go. Uh, and there's a nice campus map online as well if, if you need that. Any other questions before we jump into our first session? Okay, fantastic. So uh, let's let's get going then. Hi, I'm Meredith McGill, and I'm really thrilled to join you. Yesterday, from my office hours, you were the backs. I could see the backs of your heads. Uh, uh, it was lovely. You look good on live streaming. Um, it's just a pleasure to be here, and I'm going to give the briefest of introductions uh, to this session, then turn it over to our speakers. Uh, to, to my mind, one of the most exciting things about the digitization of a large swath of uh, American printed material is the rise of the newspaper as an object of study, particularly within departments of English. Uh, we used to leave newspapers to the historians, uh, but no more. Um, but of course, it's a huge challenge to deal with the, the range, the variety, and the sheer plenitude of sources we now have uh, clickable. Uh, uh, and unevenly so uh, from our computers. And so I can think of no better people to take us through uh, the thrills and the problems of this uh, new uh, world than the three speakers we have today. Uh, actually, it's three and a half. Uh, uh, um, uh, Laura Murray, Hester Blum, and Ryan Cordell will speak for the collective Ryan Cordell and Elizabeth uh, Dillon. So I've, I just ask our um, speakers to say one thing about themselves before they launch uh, into their papers, and uh, welcome. Hello. Um, I thank uh, Ryan and all the other organizers, and I'm really excited to be on this panel. Uh, I uh, don't know much about digital humanities, so it's been wonderful to be here, and what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is try and uh, speak from my experience, which really hasn't been primarily a digital interface with newspapers. I've worked with microfilms, I've worked with actual newspapers at the American Antiquarian Society, and I haven't used digital uh, databases very much, partly because I started working with New York antebellum papers that aren't uh, digitized very reliably, and also because my institution doesn't subscribe to many of the databases, so there's another kind of issue we can talk about later. Um, but uh, I, I'm going to um, kind of give a feel today, not for, for the, the work I've been doing, which has mainly been on uh, exchange practices and citation practices as read off the surface of the papers, 1830s and 40s, mainly dailies. Um, I have a, a chapter on that work um, coming out in a book that uh, is the other context for me of this work. Um, I've been working a lot in present day copyright policy and cultural policy. Mm -hmm. So um, my this work on newspaper exchanges uh, kind of arises both from my 19th century American work uh, as an English professor, but also um, in conversation with policy and uh, theoretical questions about how knowledge gets circulated. So the book is called Putting Intellectual Property in Its Place, and uh, this is one case study, uh, and it's the only case study from this place and time in the book. We're trying to look at places where knowledge is circulated in, in different ways. And uh, really, in some ways, I I got inspired to do this policy work partly by Meredith's work, um, thinking, yeah, you know, nobody nowadays knows that copyright was ever different. And this is, a, this is a useful kind of way to intervene in these discussions. But now I seem to be sliding back in history again. So that's all, that's all nice for me. Um, uh, the title I, I really am not going to be able to do justice to, but I was thinking yesterday about um, the pedagogical uses of some of these resources that we've been discussing and how um, reading a newspaper is perhaps a lost skill. Um, and for, so for, for our students, for example, it's uh, a genre that we have to introduce. And for some of us who are a little older, it's a genre that we have to disrupt our expectations about 
uh, when we uh, move from the 21st to the 20th and back to the 19th century, because these newspapers are not uh, like the newspapers that we may have grown up with. Um, and I'm going to emphasize in in this time today um, the uh, recalcitrance, I guess, of the of the physical and uh, I don't know, affective experience of reading newspapers for me um, as I started in on this project. And I was quite ill-prepared. I just decided I would read, when I very first started, I would read every newspaper published in New York City on September 1st, 1840. And um, I, I found it extremely difficult. So I thought today I would just think about that difficulty. And then maybe some of this will raise some issues about um, digital projects and how they might um, both overcome this difficulty and feature it in some way. Um, so this paper is, is, is 48 inches tall. This is at the American Antiquarian Society. It's the Courier from September 1st, 1840. And you know, I'm not that much taller than that. So uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, when you, when you look at these papers in the archives and they're bound like this, you don't have the advantages that somebody at the time would have had where you could fold them up and crumple them and so on. I mean, I tried not to do that at the AAS because I wanted to be invited back. But you know, really, I couldn't read this paper, OK? And of course, needless to say, and you all will know, you know, it's missing all the markers of section headings and headlines and all that kind of thing. Um, so occasionally, when I would come across papers like this, I was pretty happy. This was a, a, a very ephemeral publication, but you know, it was made for people my size, <laughs> not to mention my gender. And um, and uh, and so uh, I was always really aware of this kind of physical difficulty, some of which is produced by the archival situation or the age of the material, but is also just um, uh, produced by its um, its formal features. Um, and then I was also aware of, um, uh, of course, all the things I didn't know reading these newspapers. And again, if we think about using this material material and pedagogical situations, I think that, that we can make something of that with students. Um, to think about all the things you have to know to engage with that day's media. Um, so when I started, you know, I didn't know which candidate was associated with which party, which party was associated with which position, uh, which theater would give you a bad reputation if you went to it, <laughs> what was a fair price for Havana cigars. Uh, I didn't know sarcasm when I saw it, or I didn't know, you know, went to the tone, the, the kind of arch machismo of the editorial voice of these papers. I, I didn't know how to deal with in so many ways. So perhaps a, a somewhat equivalent experience would be if you go to another country and you pick up a newspaper and you, you have to deal not only with different political and geographical facts, but also different styles and really, a, you know, a different idea about what a newspaper voice is like. Um, so um, I, I was al always aware of that distance, and I try to be aware of it still, although I've you know, now learned you know, what the banking crisis was about and all these kinds of things, but I try to be aware of it. Um, and so in so far as this panel is called um, Newspapers of Social Media, um, my you know, somewhat polemical position here is to think, well, OK, um, but they are a particular kind of social media that is not the same as, as what students would experience now. So just a few examples um, now of um, thinking about who did know how to read these papers. So sometimes the papers mark their intended readership very directly. For example, uh, you know exactly who was supposed to be reading this paper. Um, and uh, this also happens in their address to other editors. Uh, other editors are often directly invoked and uh, debated and humiliated and so on. So uh, Mr. Warland, who recently took charge of the Manchester American, was formerly editor of the Claremont Eagle, as we now understand, not of the Claremont Crow, as we stated in a recent number of our paper. In our first announcement, we took authority from an exchange paper, what one we do not now remember, but we confess that we did not actually know whether it was a crow or an eagle, blah, blah, blah. So again, you know, this is really hard for us to read, because we don't know why these guys hate each other's guts. <laughs> and we don't know whether the guy actually does know which exchange paper he took it from, but he's pretending he doesn't. And, and so on. Um, and a third um, audience that is often directly invoked in the papers, the dailies of this period, is uh, contributors. Um, and uh, so there might be a, a little piece that says, uh, please don't send any more poems about the explosion of the Lexington steamship, um, and this kind of thing. 
um, because of course letters were more expensive to send than newspapers so to broadcast a message to contributors could be cheaper and more practical and given that there aren't um, uh, business records of most of these papers it's it's interesting to see those little vestiges and of course as as you will be aware we can also try and think about readership by looking at the advertising uh, in this case uh, we have uh, wholesale prices that would you would imagine that merchants would be reading this but this is the morning courier also 1840 and this is also the morning courier 1840 so you probably can't read that but these are the want ads in the same paper and one of them is is wanted 100 young men Americans to go on whaling voyages of various lengths and another one is wanted an American girl who understands cooking washing and ironing so this reminds us, of course, that different people read different parts of the paper, um, and so there isn't one readership. And I felt that some of the scholarship I was reading at the beginning was sort of thinking, okay, there's the Democrat papers, there's the Whig papers, there's the Merchant papers, there's the Penny papers, but uh, you know, all the papers, of course, have multiple sort of moments and possibilities for reading. And if we take this as a kind of sample first page of um, of a paper of the period. Um, we have ads, we have a, a poem, we have the gypsy's prophecy, and we have a, a something from the life of Mrs. Martha Washington. And uh, again, not to be too difficult here, but I just don't think we can presume very much about who read any of these things. And that reminds me that one of the purposes of a newspaper is to kill time. And how you read a newspaper depends on how much time you have to kill. Uh, and what you read. So some of it will be determined by practical needs, like I need a job or I need to buy a house, but some of it is going to be determined by what you're doing at that time. And again, this is something that now we have smartphones we don't have to use newspapers for, but um, passing the time is one of them. And um, I, I always want to say, I don't think that it's easy to know who's reading these things. Um, this is a kind of evidence of reading that I come across a lot. I have a lot of photographs like this. Um, and uh, so, you know, uh, work on scrapbooks by Ellen and other people does illuminate this to some extent about, um, you know, what people did with things they cut out. This could have been cut out by another editor, or an exchange editor. It could have been cut out by someone who wanted to uh, buy something and needed to stick that piece of paper in their pocket. It could have been uh, a library user who, who took it out. It could be someone who wanted to keep a poem and put it in a scrapbook. Um, but this is obviously frustrating kind of non-information information about reading that, um, that we come across. So um, another thing that the American Antiquarian Society has and the librarians really drew to my attention is this wonderful um, collection of, of images and, and images of people reading newspapers and um, this is the monopolist um, who is monopolizing the fireplace and the newspaper and God knows what else um, and and certainly these papers address themselves to guys like this most directly right um, but we can see um, in other images as, as many of you will know that the newspaper is also starts to be imagined as a as a family improvement device um, this is from a um, uh, certificate of the Rhode Island Temperance Union and um, this is one side of the cartouche the other side of the cartouche is uh, what happens if you don't have a newspaper in your house evidently um, and uh, so we see newspapers associated with a certain kind of domestic virtue but uh, and this is this kind of iconography of the newspaper is something I would like to be doing more work on and I think there's a lot of possibilities here for digital humanities approaches as well um, this is I, I think a very beautiful and touching engraving um, called uh, <coughs> news from the war uh, from the 1850s and we see here that the newspaper can have a different effect on the domestic space I mean here destroying it essentially um, where this woman has has read this news that has rendered her great. Um, but another thing that I wouldn't have noticed had it not been for the help of librarians there is that the girl is wearing a newspaper hat and uh, there are a lot of images of newspaper hats which then starts to remind us of non-reading uses of newspapers, non-reading uses of print that we, we talked about a bit later um, yesterday and um, so that's, that's another kind of dimension when we're thinking about materiality. And my, uh, I think I must be running out of time, so um, my last couple of images are on that topic too. Um, again, because uh, newspapers were cheaper to mail than letters, uh, occasionally, and I should say really occasionally, because on the one hand we were talking yesterday about the importance of including 
in digitization projects, including marginalia and so on. Um, that could be exaggerated. I mean, I've read I don't know how many hundreds of papers and so on, and this is the only time I've seen this. So, um, but uh, this this is a note. Uh, some I don't know how do you read the first uh, the name, but let's say Ted. I want to see you the worst way. Send me the next number of the paper you sent me last, so that I can something something. And this is the Angelica reporter from Allegheny County in New York uh, State. And um, this is on another page of it. Uh, well, and I don't know what this name is. It's a name like Theed or something. How goes the Times? Hey. <laughs> um, so here, the newspaper is being used as just a uh, substrate, you know, for a kind of a, kind of a communication. So um, I, I, I just wanted to, I guess, to, to think a, a little bit in a recalcitrant way about the difficulties of newspapers and also the, the specificity of their moments of reading and reception because, you know, when we read them, we are just so much not the right readers. And that would be true of any old document, of course, but I just think newspapers, uh, for me, you know, put it in my, in my face in that way. And newspapers were, of course, only meant to last a day. And we're, we're reading them. And I think part of the fun part is that, uh, is that thing that we're doing that is sort of wrong with respect to the newspaper. Um, there was a Canadian Supreme Court case in 2006 that um, had to resolve the question of whether a digital archive was a newspaper. Like, was a digital archive of a newspaper a newspaper? And the Supreme Court said, no, it isn't, because the newspaper is the arrangement of the material within that day's issue, and the digital archive disaggregates that in all sorts of ways. Now, people said, oh, these old fogies on the Supreme Court, what do they know, et cetera, et cetera. But I kind of, I kind of think, you know, here, at least for these polemical purposes, that they were right, that it's an event, a newspaper. And so as we think about digitizing it, we might think about the different ways we can cluster the experience of reading it. So just a few then little <coughs> concluding marks. So thinking about the identity of each number and issue in place and in time, even as we think about the networks, of course, of exchange and so on, which really determine the nature of the genre. And, you know, I, I'm very excited to see the work that's going on with mapping because that will be essential to understanding that. Uh, also keeping in mind that nobody except some weird person like me might read an entire newspaper. I mean, even if it's only four pages long, it, it, it isn't something that we actually do. Um, so people read different newspapers. I mean, we might say that as novel, about novels in a kind of literary theoretical way, but it's just uh, true just in terms of eyeballs in newspapers. Uh, each copy is potentially unique. So we discussed yesterday about, you know, marginalia and other evidence of reading um, that might be taken into account. And, and really, essentially, that most newspapers are missing. Um, that uh, no matter uh, whether we uh, scan all the ones we have, they're still mostly all missing. Uh, so big data is, uh, is really essential in that way, but then we have to think about ways to accommodate that reality. So I think that's enough for me right now. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Hester Blum, and I'm going to attempt to give myself a very brief intro while I also attempt to change, um, and I have to say the word dongle, and I regret having to <laughs> put that word in all of your ears um, <laughs> on this lovely morning. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you to Ryan and all the organizers and all the sponsors. Um, I am, do I have the right dongle? I'll give that a moment. Um, I am working on a, a project on uh, polar newspapers and on oceanic studies uh, more broadly. And I'm going to uh, take the time I have today to give a few um, minutes of introduction to uh, the, the project as a whole. I'm going to show you a few examples of what I mean by polar newspapers um, and then close with an example uh, from one of these newspapers. I. Um, <laughs> begin by the presumption that um, few of you have possibly encountered the idea that there is such a thing as a polar newspaper. Um, by polar newspapers here, I'm referring to the newspapers that were produced and circulated by polar expedition members from about 1819 through, well, it continues to this day, but I'm, I'm focusing on um, the 100 years that follow the first Arctic newspaper in 1819. Um, produced, distributed, written by, circulated among expedition members themselves while in the polar regions in the total darkness of polar winter 
where depending if you are at the North or South Pole, the sun does not appear at all for 60 to 90 days um, in temperatures that reached 80 below zero. Um, and here's the, here's the kicker, most of these were done on printing presses that were aboard ship. Um, printing presses starting in 1850 appeared on most pol Anglo-American polar expeditions um, and some Norwegian and German ones as well. Um, there were also manuscript newspapers that survive. Um, these are newspapers that few historians of polar expeditions have paid much attention to. At most in the popular histories of polar expeditions, there might be a paragraph or a page devoted to winter entertainments, which also included theatricals, which are very common aboard um, naval vessels. Um, they also included uh, other uh, performative means of, of entertainment. Um, but the newspapers are fairly unique to the polar regions. Uh, long voyaging ships uh, very rarely had newspapers that were produced by the crews of those ships. Passengers on long voyages might produce newspapers for entertainment. Um, the Victorianist Jason Rudy at Maryland is doing a totally brilliant project on passenger newspapers. But this is one of the only examples of crew produced newspapers. Um, for example, in merchant ships more generally, and the vast resources of the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, England, they have only six manuscript newspapers. Now again, many of them would not have found their way into the archive, but given again the volume and the multiple thousands of ships they have, um, this suggests how relatively rare this was. And this all has to do with um, what Laura, in her terrific presentation, talked about in, in terms of killing time. And the killing time here is not just the reading of the newspaper, but the production <laughs> of the newspaper. Um, and so that's what I'm interested in, this, this killing time moment. Um, these uh, newspapers were largely comic. They did not replicate the material that shows up in the official voyage narratives that nearly every polar expedition produced. And those polar voyaging narratives were good sellers. They were popular um, among readers. The expeditions themselves, which were largely nationally sponsored, had huge fans, readership, um, attention throughout uh, various political, cultural uh, worlds with, throughout the 19th century and the early 20th century in particular. Um, but the content of these newspapers, and this is where the social media part comes in, um, is not directed towards the aims of the expedition. This is entirely a scandal sheet, um, for the most part, about the expeditions. Um, or you'll have playful literary productions, um, some serious. And this is, again, something that does not get replicated in the voyage narratives themselves. And except in a very few cases, these newspapers also do not get reprinted. Um, occasionally, there are excerpts from them that are in the printed voyage narratives as a way of illustrating how um, time was killed while on the ice in the total darkness of polar winter and under the extremity of ink that had to be thawed in order to be spread on the rollers. Um, and it's also a moment in which, um, unlike the, and this is the, the really crucial part and where my broader interest in oceanic studies comes in, although I won't say much about that at this present moment, um, the cl these have closed circuits of circulation, um, and as you might imagine. <laughs> um, even as these sailors are taking a form that we associate with the nation um, after Benedict Anderson, um, they, and they're on national missions, they're producing these newspapers which represent not, they don't just imagine a community, they represent d very directly the totality of that community. And, rep and in a way that a newspaper fictively can only imagine. Um, they also are located at, in a world elsewhere, they are thousands and thousands of miles from normal literary circuits, and yet they inhabit all of the familiar forms that we associate with the, the circuits of the day. So. That's my preamble. Let me show you a few examples of some of these newspapers. Um, and this is a, a, a selection that includes um, manuscript newspapers. Again, this is the, the flight of the plover. There will often be manuscript newspapers on ships that had printing presses um, for a, a variety of reasons having to do with speed and access and the uses of the presses for sometimes for other official business. One thing I should also mention, too, is that polar expedition ships tended to be very small in the number of crew. It has a, a, a relatively small crew number. They range from about 10 
at, at their largest, they had um, uh, about 100 men, 120 men. Uh, the famous Sir John Franklin expedition had 129 men. Um, but for the most part, their number in the, the, the low um, double digits. Um, so the circulation was, again, exceptionally intimate. Um, the one, one of the things that uh, is pretty fantastic, too, is that the, they pay a lot of attention to the conventions of print when it comes to the actual imprint of a lot of these um, expeditions. Um, I'm going to move through these very quickly. The quality and range and format of, this is one of my favorite newspaper titles, <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, ranges um, quite substantially. And by the later uh, 19th century and early 20th century, this had become such an expectation of polar voyaging that the, the papers became quite elaborate. And you'll see a few of those as well. Um, it's the Queen's Illuminated Magazine and North Cornwall Gazette. Um, that one did not come through. This is a manuscript newspaper that has this fantastic um, black star against a very red background. It looks very modern, um, which I wish I could show you here. Um, this is a, 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 an inside shot of the Port Folk Weekly News. Again, a ship that had a press aboard but did not use it. Uh, the Discovery News, this is on the Nares expedition, which did a ton of printing. Um, some of them were um, much more <laughs> ephemeral. Uh, the, uh, and the, the kinds of printing that they did, and a lot of these were, used, do, um, were done using small desktop presses, which came into popular circulation in the 1870s and 80s in the US. And Laura Langer Cohen is doing completely amazing work on um, teenage boy newspapers, where she characterizes how boring the content of, the, of, of these newspapers are, and that the design of them was for their exchange value only, and not um, f for, she, she talks about how um, no one would start a newspaper because they had something to say. Um, it was a social act. Um, and what's interesting about these polar newspapers is that it's absolutely a social act, and they did run out of things to say. But what the newspapers that Laura Cohn is looking at did they were, they were able for their content to list all of the exchanges they were doing with other newspapers. So they become purely social. Um, and the exchange that can happen with these polar newspapers is one that is only an intra-ship exchange. Um, there are sometimes rival newspapers aboard ships. Um, and there are occasionally many jokes, uh, not occasionally, there are many jokes made about different forms that print inhabit. Um, but the, there is no possibility of actual exchange. I showed you this opening slide of the printing of the Arctic Eagle, and you see um, how um, intimately social um, these worlds are. This is aboard a ship. You see men in the bunks, in their, um, in their blankets, in their woolens, um, while this particular agent, um, this is on the uh, Fiala Ziegler expedition, um, is uh, um, engaged in printing. And here's an example of the kind of thing he was printing on that press. So this is a... Uh, an image from that expedition. Um, so there's a, a certain degree of skill that goes into um, the, this production here. Um, as they became more elaborate, this is from um, uh, Robert Falcon Scott's first command. Um, his lieutenant, one Ernest Shackleton, was the editor of the South Polar Times. Um, this is a presentation copy of it that I, um, from, it's bound in sealskin. It's the most spectacular volume I've ever seen. I accidentally, I think I must have been texting and took this photo in an archive that does not allow digital photos. I'm not sure how this appeared on my phone, and yet. Um, <laughs> so for the live stream, um, this is a completely an error. Um, so occasionally they recirculated as gift copies to patrons. Um, the contributions to these newspapers were largely anonymous. Here's a drop box for the South Polar Times with a very um, drunken looking sun there, which is not appearing in the morning. Um, the most elaborate is Ernest Shackleton's first command, not his famous um, expedition, um, produced a book called Aurora Australis um, that was written, again, entirely by the men. At this point, for Shackleton in eight, 1908, he had his crew train with a London printer for two weeks. So at this point, this went beyond a way to kill time and had, by design, become an artifact of the expedition. They printed 90 copies, six or ex 60 of those 90 are extant. Um, they used whatever materials they had on hand. So this is the stewed kidney edition, which I think is at the John Carter Brown Library. Um, this is the fruit edition at the Huntington. Um, they are incredibly beautifully uh, produced. Um, there are a lot of playbills produced on these, t in addition to newspapers, playbills produced on these presses as well. 
um, that give us a sense of what's happening aboard the ship. Some of these are popular farces of the day. The pantomime of zero at the bottom is, was written by the men. Um, this was a production aboard ship. They liked it so much they did it over and over again with other plays. Um, they wrote songs. This is how it looked in the facsimile of the Illustrated Arctic News, which is the first printed newspaper. And I show you this because the large type headings, as well as the arms and devices, were cut on board by the seamen. So they're not just taking the presses that they have on hand, which have to do with rescue missions with Sir John Franklin, I can explain that, um, in their first iteration, and then it becomes a, a habit. But they're um, adapting the presses to their own use. Um, when, when you're using that press only to produce um, silk messages of relief for a lost expedition, you don't necessarily have large font type. Mm -hmm. And so the sailors um, adapted this. They also had um, programs for their pops. What I, I show you this one in particular because you can see that um, there are minstrel shows even in the Arctic, the Pale O'Christy Minstrels. Um, you'll notice the printing office on Trap Lane. Um, there's no lane here, obviously. <laughs> um, the, uh, these, the, these are farcical uh, allusions to the locations aboard the ship where this all happens. Uh, here's a, an illustration of how of the pops in process. As you can see, there's a tent that's been erected on top of the ship just to give you a sense of how they're actually inhabiting this space. Um, the ice that has built up here is ice that's been cleared away from the ship or from, uh, from around it. Um, and also a way to deal with the nonstop condensation below decks. Um, every breath freezes, so a huge amount of the labor in the polar winter um, has to do with removing the frozen condensation from the interior of the ship so they're not buried alive within the ship itself. So you can see that process here, um, as well as a sense of how chilly it is. Um, just a few other examples. Here's a song. You can see the, um, the, the printer um, datelines as the Arctic regions, 1851. Some of them are uh, printed on silk. Um, there's silk aboard ship for many different reasons for having to do with print, but I show you this one in particular because I love the hand hemming. Um, sailors are fantastic. Um, seam, what is, is there a male version of seamstress? Seamsters. Um, so a few are retained as souvenirs again um, or given to patrons. You see some fancy ones here. Um, I show you also the, the date line here of Melville Island Press. Um, Melville Island, and just to give you a sense of the scale we're talking about here, is up here. Uh, so we're at an except, and this is very far north. Um, you're at an exceptional distance from um, any possibility. The, the whaling fleets would get really no higher than here. Um, and so this is a, a, a really uh, remote location. Um, the Arctic Printing Office here, too. Um, they have assumed possession of the premises of uh, an Arctic uh, printing office. Um, I'm going to move through these quickly. The Bar Barrow Amateur Office. Um, there are not a lot of invocations of the word amateur, which Laura Cohen's work really focuses on. Um, there's a, the play acting is entirely about the professionalization of these acts. Um, uh, the, um, I'm showing you this one for the note at the bottom. The business of the printing office is considerably retarded in consequence of the ink freezing on the rollers signed by the printer's devil, a common problem. And so very, very briefly, I'm, I'm running out of time here. The first Arctic newspaper, the North Georgia Gazette and Winter Chronicle, um, originally the New Georgia Gazette and Winter Chronicle, until they realized there was already a New Georgia, and it became North Georgia, was uh, written by the officers on William Edward Parry's first uh, Arctic expedition. It was a Northwest Passage expedition. And this was a failed newspaper, not because it didn't produce a lot of copies, because it did, but it produced nothing but dissension among the men. Um, and the, there was a fight that was staged in the newspaper between what are called the NCs, or the non-contributors, and this is non-contributors to the paper, not to the labor of the expedition, um, and those who are contributing. And this became a really rhetorically violent fight. Again, all playful, but there were threats to brand the NCs with red hot irons, to flay them, to hang them, all playful. Um, and this is a small subset of this 100-man expedition. These are 20 officers, um, about seven of whom only were contributing to the paper. And it produced a, a lot of, uh, of, of enough problems that um, there was not another Arctic newspaper for 30 years after this. Um, it seemed to be a failed way of ensuring sociability. And this is where the social network part comes in. Um, the, this was one that was actually reprinted, but the version that was reprinted expurgated most of the angry articles about the NCs. Um, and I'll leave you with um, 
the one of the poems that was expurgated, um, which is not showing up in full on this screen. Maybe if I turn the thing. Um, that was a bad idea. I'll, I'll leave it as it is. Um, the the poem um, threatens to uh, produce uh, bad social effects on the non-contributors to the newspaper. Um, the the bottom part of this quotation, um, the once they return to port, the threat is when they return to the world, we'll roar it out to all the world when once again our sails are furled, that the non-contributors to the social production of this newspaper um, presumes a non-contribution to the broader mission of these particular expeditions. And so the ways in which um, the everything from the, what we think of as uh, someone's Facebook wall, which is set to friends only, which is in many ways how these newspapers are functioning. They're inside jokes, only some of which I can get. Um, this is a problem that Laura mentioned as well. Um, and the ways in which you know you have your thing that you set to global or the production on Twitter where people are listening in only if they know you and wish to listen in. Um, the threat of what non-contribution to the social world meant, which in later newspapers was mediated somewhat by the inclusion of the entire crew in the production of the newspaper. There were common seamen who were writing content, they were printing content, um, and that seemed to solve the problem of non-contribution, uh, both on the social and on the expedition scale of these particular projects. Um, and so I'll, I'll stop now, but I'll just mention very, very quickly as well, um, for various non-important reasons, uh, an article on my current research appeared on a, a broader Penn State newswire in the last week. and. I received an email from someone getting a PhD in information technology who's working on social media, and her example is the sinking of the recent replica of the HMS Bounty. Mm -hmm. um, and she is herself a sailor on tall ships, mm -hmm. and had mentioned um, that very kindly that she had read my first book, which is on sailors' literary culture, and that it was something that had been passed to her by another sailor on a tall ship, mm -hmm. and that she had in turn passed along, and this is the entire point of my first book, is that sailor reading was completely communal and constant. And she said that the book was probably headed to the Caribbean at the moment, which was happy news for um, the book. This is a, <laughs> she came across my work though through a, a Twitter feed produced by Penn State um, that she had retweeted in turn, but then also produced another Penn State alum who wrote to me to say that when he was on an Arctic icebreaker, um, in the Navy in, 186, in 19, 1960, um, they produced multiple newspapers, and I asked him if he had retained any copies of these newspapers. This is, again, all propelled by social media, the, their awareness of my work. And he said, I did not maintain the newspapers because at the time I was not a historian. And so I, I, I leave with the thought of what it means to curate these as worthy of our historical and literary study. Thank you. Well, I, I mean, I'm <clears throat> already seeing just a phenomenal uh, range of connections with these with these talks that I might be excited to explore in the Q and A as well. Um, sorry, let me get. Uh, So uh, building on uh, some of the conversations, the really necessary conversations we've been having here, uh, I want to talk about a project and, and hopefully offer it as an example of a project in which the, the digital methodologies uh, that we're employing are actually very central to the interpretive uh, move that we want to make. They're central to the question of the project. We've talked a lot about these moments when the tool is sort of more used for the tool's sake and when it's used for actual intervention. And I think I can make a case that, that we're doing a good job. I, I hope you'll agree. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the project. Uh, and this is building really directly on what, uh, especially Laura's talk, but also Hester's. Um, the 19th century newspaper is this odd beast, right? It, it doesn't, as Laura said, look very much like uh, you know today's New York Times or, or any newspaper that we grew up with. Um, we're really trying to get at this idea. We use uh, this uh, de Tocqueville quote as a, as a masthead for the project of the newspaper as being able to drop the same thought into a thousand minds at the same moment. And we're really trying to get at uh, the details of this. What, 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 what are these same thoughts that get dropped and how do they get dropped into these minds? 
Um, and what does the same moment mean in the 19th century, actually, which is different than I think we think of it? And uh, Bennett Anderson has come up several times. We're trying to think about what kinds of communities these newspapers are building, um, whether they are uh, communities around faction, around uh, political affiliation, or whether they are differently configured than that. So when you look at the 19th century newspaper, you see all kinds of stuff, right? This is one page of one newspaper, and we've got something that we would recognize as news. We've got something that's really kind of an op-ed, right? It starts with, there are still those who would sell the birthright of our nation's glory for a mess of official pottage, right? This is, oh, so still we're in the realm of what we might expect to find in a newspaper today. But we also have fiction. We have these things called anecdotes. I'm going to get back to what, what I think this is all about in a second. We have poetry. We have travel narratives, and we have recipes, and we have all kinds of things in the newspaper. And we also know uh, from the work of Meredith uh, and others that, that there's a culture of reprinting. So this Whittier poem also appears here with a different title, The Corn Song, where it was Songs of Labor before. And it appears here and here. And these are only four examples. Uh, we found about 30 or so uh, where this was reprinted. For me, this interest in reprinting really all started with a, with a Hawthorne project that I was working on. I had, I had found, doing very traditional archival research, a copy of a Hawthorne story in a newspaper where I didn't expect to find it. And so I started digging, like, what's going on here? Um, and I read Meredith's work, and I went to C.E. Fraser Clark's uh, biography, bibliography of Hawthorne's work. And uh, when I looked at the bibliography, I immediately realized that this sort of random copy of Hawthorne that I had found was not in the bibliography. I thought, well, this is odd. It's not here. And so then I started uh, going, and I started searching in digital archives just to see what I could find. And in a couple of weeks of just searching in digital archives, I found about three times as many copies as were in that official bibliography. And the reason I could find it is quite obvious, right? I now have all of this text that I can search. I have a, I have a different resource at my disposal. Um, find some key phrases from this Hawthorne story, search for them, you're going to find lots of copies of it. But then this, this sort of kept nagging at me, right? Because I, I realized that I had found this Hawthorne story because I knew about the Hawthorne story. I had those key phrases to search. But what you can't do is this. You can't say, find all the reprinted text in this archive, please. Uh, <laughs> the archive doesn't know what to do with a question like that. We also have some additional problems in that the, the actual stuff that you're searching, the OCR, the text behind it, is pretty bad. right? Most of these projects were massive projects, scanning thousands or even millions of pages of newspapers. Um, and no one's going through and editing those. So actually, this, this is actually not a bad one. This is, a cop this is the Raven from one of the copies that you can find in, uh, in the Chronicling America collection. But, you know, or upon a midnight dreary while I pondered rack and weary over many a quaint and curious, you know, this is actually not bad. Uh, there's much worse OCR in the collection. But this is a problem, because if you happen to search for once upon a midnight, you would not find this, right? Because it doesn't say once upon a midnight. It says or upon a midnight. Right? <laughs> So this is when I started working with David Smith, who is a computer scientist here at Northeastern University. And his background is in computational linguistics, natural language processing. And he's very interested in large corpora of text that he can use to perform experiments about human language and how it's constructed and how people communicate. And he's particularly interested in reused text, right? Yay. Right. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> So uh, these next few slides, these are David's slides. And I'm going to try and talk you through the algorithm that he's developed to try and identify these. Because David also cannot just say, go find reprinted text. It's actually it's not that easy at all. We have a lot of problems. We have a problem, I should say, first of all, we're working right now with Chronically America. That's the archive we're working with because it's open. We can get at the data. Um, and we can talk about some of the other databases that we're hoping to get access to soon. But all of this is just based on this one collection. It's like going into one archive. Right? <coughs> Um, so the problem is we want to find these similar clusters 
uh, across different pages, but they're not in the same place in different newspapers. They're not always the same length in different newspapers. They don't always have titles that you, you can't just look for titles, you can't just look for authors, because that all changes. As editors swap stories during the 19th century, they change all this stuff. This is pre-copyright law, right? People are just, if, if I'm an editor in St. Louis, I, I just grab whatever the heck I want from all the newspapers that I subscribe to in New York and Philadelphia and, and, and Boston, and I reprint it and I change it along the way. So we have these clusters that are the same but not identical that we want to find. And there are lots of kinds of duplicate texts that for our study at least we're not interested in. Other scholars might be, but we don't want mastheads that appear in every single issue of a particular newspaper. And we don't want advertisements that appear over and over and over and over again in the same newspaper. And then during our early experiments, actually what we got was almost all advertisements. Uh, and so we had to figure out a way to filter those out. And we have this problem. This is a, a, a less good uh, version of OCR from a different newspaper page. So what are we going to do? So we want to develop this algorithm that's going to crawl all of these newspapers and try and find approximate alignments. And uh, my simple version of this, uh, you may have used the ngram viewer, Google ngram viewer. An ngram is a sequence of text of however many uh, words. A five gram is a sequence of five words. And so David's algorithm goes through. It cuts the entire archive into five grams. Her Majesty dears to congratulate. Her Majesty dears to, uh, sorry, Majesty dears to congratulate the, dears to congratulate the president, right? Bunch of five grams. And then it goes page by page, and it just counts all of these five grams and says, how many matching five grams am I finding from page to page? And if it finds enough matching five grams on any two pages, it spits it out and says, I think I found a reprint. I think these are the same. And then at the end of the process, it has all of these pairs. I think this is the same as this. I think this is the same as this. These chunks of text. Then it looks at all of those chunks, and it tries to group them. Well, I actually think these 30 are the same thing. They look like they're the same thing. Statistically, it would be unlikely that they're not the same thing. And what we end up with are clusters of reprinted texts that look kind of like this, actually. So this is a temperance story by T.S. Arthur, uh, a name that's probably familiar to people who know the 19th century, that was pretty widely reprinted, and we have it as a cluster here. And this has been uh, really productive so far. The point of this slide is to show you that we are now working with 392,266 <laughs> reprinted texts that we've identified in this one archive, uh, Chronicling America. All right, so what are we finding? That's the question that literary folks want to know. What kinds of things went viral? Um, I'm going to talk about that term here in a second. But a lot of political speeches, right? This is perhaps not a surprise. Politics is in the news. Uh, president gives a State of the Union address. It gets widely reprinted. There's a lot of news. Um, this is the uh, announcement of the completion of the transatlantic cable. Uh, this is the Queen's uh, message to the President, which she sends to sort of uh, inaugurate the, the cable. Uh, and actually we found that this goes, goes around the country twice. It goes around the country once with a lot of commentary about how curt and sort of rude the Queen was. And then they discover that the uh, telegraph operator actually failed to transcribe the entire message. And so then it goes around the country again with a lot of apologies that, oh, the Queen actually wasn't as rude as we thought. Um, <laughs> We have a lot of sentimental tales, a lot of tales of domesticity, tales of young love, things of this nature that would be unsurprising to people who know much about the fiction of the period. We heard about the wide, wide world yesterday, right? Things that are right, right in that, uh, that wheelhouse. Quite a few travel narratives. Uh, this is an account of a journey through the Paris sewer system on a flat-bottomed boat that gets widely reprinted. It is attributed to a correspondent of a Swedish journal uh, we can't track down. Lots of jokes. Um, I, I, keep, I always try and explain this joke, and it's never funny, uh, because you can't explain a joke, and it's a 19th century joke. Um, but it's, it's a domestic joke, and it's, it's, I find it funny. I'm not going to explain it. And of course, uh, lots of poetry. This is a poem by a Scottish poet, uh, Charles Mackay, that goes, uh, that's widely reprinted uh, in our set, changes uh, titles, changes the first line. The real advantage of David's method is that these texts don't have to match from end to end. And so we can account for actually two problems. We can account for the editorial changes that are made to these texts in the 19th century, 
because they don't have to match from end to end. And we can also account for all of the bad OCR, the changes made by digitizing in the 20th and 21st century. Um, and we don't get everything by any means. We can talk about that, but we get a lot, right? Recipes. This is a, a recipe you can take home for uh, making your own gum Arabic starch if you, if you need some starch. Advice columns. This is a kind of, I think we would call it a sort of syrupy, hallmarky sort of, you should, you should have something to live for so that you live each day to the fullest kind of sentiment, but a widely reprinted piece. Uh, lists are popular on the internet. Lists were also popular in 19th century newspapers, it turns out. Uh, lots of these things that remind me of, of BuzzFeed. <laughs> you know, the fifth, fifth, here, you know, 15 maxims to guide a young man. It doesn't have the number at the front, but it might as well. And then the thing that I'm probably finding the most fascinating is this, is this genre that I am struggling for a name for. I've been calling them anecdotes. I've been calling them vignettes. And these are these pieces that, that's, to me, sort of embody the form of the 19th century newspaper in that they are neither fact nor fiction. They, they attribute uh, themselves to something that seems sort of factual, but they're impossible to track down or sort of verify. And so this is actually the maxims for young men. This is a later reprinting of that same list that I just showed you. But uh, this little introduction has been attached to it that says that it was found in the pocketbook of honor the Honorable Stephen Allen, who was drowned several years ago by a steamboat uh, disaster on the Hudson River. And we found this printed slip apparently cut out from a newspaper with the following copy. And you get a lot of these that sort of uh, gesture towards being news, right? We found this document. We're transcribing it for you. But that also seem to sort of partake of fiction as well. And, and I find these really a fascinating genre. So we've learned that there's a, we, we can actually identify a, a kind of a time lag here. Uh, this is some more of David's work. He's done some statistical modeling of terms associated with texts that move around the country very quickly, which tend to be these sort of newsy terms, government, tariff, Taylor, that's the president, Taylor, uh, Mexico, Texas, and these terms that seem statistically at least to be associated with uh, slow moving texts, which for me seem more literary, right? Love, young, earth, awoke, fine. Uh, and this is something David's just beginning to explore, but I find it very evocative actually when I look at the text as a literary scholar to think about this. So I'm going to move quickly through some of the modeling we're doing, but some of the things that we're experimenting with is how we can use this huge corpus we have of you know, hundreds of thousands of reprinted texts to begin to model 19th century print in a really big way. And this is the, almost the, the, the complementary but opposite study of what Laura was talking about. Um, so we've done some comparative mapping. We've got uh, historical county boundaries, historical census data. We can try and at least get a snapshot of who might have lived near where things appeared. And, and these are rough because the census you know, it works in pretty broad terms. But we can begin to compare. Do different stories circulate to different parts of the country? Um, do poems circulate differently than, uh, than news pieces? Um, we've begun to experiment with time and thinking again about geography, time, and the kinds, the genres of text that we're working with begun to think about how the relationship between print and transportation networks. And so thinking over time, what the relationship between something like the rail, this, this data about the railroad comes from Will Thomas's project at Nebraska, Railroads in the Making of Modern America. He kindly gave us all of his data about historical rail networks. So we began to think about this relationship between the railroad and this system of reprinting. And, and again, to think, uh, to do some playing with time as well. Th this is a, a new sort of experiments I have uh, bringing these uh, a particular reprinting history together with uh, the growth of the railroad and, and trying to get a sense of that relationship. And then we talked a lot about these graphs yesterday, but we've been doing uh, some network analysis. So one thing that uh, we can say actually is that reprinting uh, is a pretty good uh, indicator of relationship between newspapers. And so let me describe what you're looking at here. The nodes in this case are individual newspapers. They are sized based on their centrality to the network. And what that means is, in our data set, these are newspapers that print a lot of things that other newspapers reprint. Right? That's how we're modeling this. The lines between these newspapers represent shared reprints. So a very, very thin line means that these two newspapers share only a few reprints. A very, very thick line means that they're sharing hundreds and hundreds of reprints. Um, and what this and the colors too actually uh, have something to say. The colors uh, are trying to identify communities. So these are groups of newspapers that are frequently sharing with one another. 
right? And what this begins to indicate, uh, at least within our data set, again, only these chronicling American newspapers that we're working with, are the kinds of relationships that might have existed. The fact that two newspapers share one reprint doesn't tell us very much. But if two newspapers are sharing, uh, as, in the, as is the case for some of these, a thousand, 1,500 reprints. That actually tells us quite a bit, I think, about a pot potential relationship. And these graphs have been very evocative for further research. So one of the things we've done is when we see a very strong relationship in the model, then we go and look at those individual newspapers and the editors and try and determine what is this relationship. And we've uncovered uh, relationships between editors, for instance, from the model. And in this case, because we're dealing with so many thousands of connections, actually, this is not something that you can just read. Creating the model is actually the only way to kind of get in this, into this in a systemic way that then allows us to dig in and do the kind of close reading that we want to do about, okay, well then why? Why is this relationship there? Oh, I, and I should also, you know, I can say it with this slide actually. Um, the other thing that has been exciting about this is that at least within our data set, it's brought to light the centrality of places that I think we don't tend to think of when we think about print culture in the 19th century. You'll note that really large spot there in the middle, that's Nashville, Tennessee, which at least within our data, Nashville, Tennessee seems to be a central broker of information during the 19th century. And this is perhaps not surprising, it's right in the middle of the country, right? But I think most scholars of the 19th century would say you don't think immediately of Nashville when you think of like, where should I be studying print culture? You don't go to Nashville. But the National Union in American is kind of the central newspaper in our data, at least right now. So this is that same network graph uh, projected geographically. So again, the nodes represent the kind of centrality to the network. The colors represent different communities. And you can see that some of those communities are very geographically dense, and some of them are very spread out. And these are the places that we want to explore further. So briefly here at the end, I want to talk about why we're using this, this language of virality. And in some ways, what we're trying to do is really explicitly connect this uh, historical moment that we're looking at with our current moment. Uh, I find this very uh, evocative for students. I find it a way to talk about this research that resonates with, say, like the press, with the general public. Um, but, I, but I actually think that there's, there's more to it than that, which is to say, you know, I, I'm a great believer that there is nothing new under the sun. Uh, that human beings have always been sharing content. And in a lot of my classes, I talk with students about how I try and help my students realize that technology is not this thing that we came up with a decade ago, but like, <laughs> technology is this thing that humans have been doing for a really long time. Um, so I, I like this article by Robert Payne very much, and he's really just talking about sort of our current discussions of virality and, and how they're beneficial, but also how problematic they are. And in this case, he's talking about this idea of measuring things by Facebook likes. And for pain, it's really problematic, right? Because the like is this, he calls it a flat signifier. It doesn't tell you much about why anyone clicked something. You know, as he says here, it could be that they actually liked the thing. It could be because their sister posted it and they felt like if I don't like it, my sister will think I don't like her, so I need to click it. Um, there are all these sort of motivations. And when you just say like this, piece on Facebook got you know, 10,000 likes, it doesn't get at that. It doesn't tell you why people did it. And what is that? The more I've been thinking about it, though, this reprinting is a similarly flat signifier. It doesn't actually tell us much about why two newspapers shared something. And we're finding when we dig in and we find, you know, we, we get really excited when we find like an editorial preface that actually explains why they reprinted something. That's very rare. But when we find it, we get very excited. We find that there are all kinds of reasons, <coughs> right? Uh, their colleagues are printing it. They're printing it because they like it. They're printing it because they think it's a load of you know, BS, right? Uh, they want to comment on it. Um, they're printing it because they need to fill three inches in the newspaper, and it's about three inches long, right? There are all of these motivations that lead to that reprinting. And so just knowing that it was reprinted isn't the end of the story. We have to dig in and figure out why and what's going on here. So what are we doing uh, to that end? I wanted, you, some of you would have talked to Abby last night about the work that she's doing with our editors. Um, we're, we're doing a lot of annotation, not only of the newspapers, so learning who edited them from when, what their affiliations were, because one of the things we want to do is begin to compare, okay, well, what does the Whig network look like versus the Democratic network? Is there a lot of sharing going on between those two, or are they kind of isolated communities? Again, to get back to Benedict Anderson, right? Um, we've also been doing a lot of annotation of the clusters themselves. So uh, Peter Roby, Kevin Smith, who are not here, have been annotating, um, giving them titles, <laughs> because often they don't have them. 
do we know who the author of these pieces were or not? What kind of thing is it? Is it a poem? Is it, an, uh, is it a temperance story? Uh, what, what's its topic, right? All this kind of annotation. And you can see, at least for the editors, the kinds of things that we're trying to figure out, both those things that fit well in the table, as we talked about yesterday, and those things that don't fit well in the table. There's Abby, right there. <laughs> Abby's been doing heroic work. I always have to sort of bring, bring her up because I think the work that she's been doing needs eventually to make its way into the Library of Congress's entries on these newspapers because it's really incredible work. Um, okay, so the upshot of this is that we're going to have our data online really soon. So viraltext.org, in the next couple of weeks, you're going to be able to go look at all these reprinted texts that we're finding. Um, see the clusters, see the annotations that we've begun to do, although we're going to be actively annotating even once it's live. and Click on those pages and actually get into the image of the newspaper so that you can actually read the newspaper and see where it was situated. Um, and we're hoping that this is going to lead to a lot more research because, frankly, I can't actually study 40,000 texts. Uh, I don't have the capacity. I'm hoping lots of people will study these texts and that we're going to learn something really incredible about uh, 19th century print culture. I'm not going to do that. So yeah. Uh, I wanted to thank David Smith, who's not here. Of course, uh, Elizabeth uh, maddock Dillon, who's going to be part of the Q&A. Our grad RAs and, and the NEH, who has been supporting this work. Uh, and the new lab, where we're, where we're housed. So, thank you. Um, I'm going to start us off with just a lead question, but this is such, such rich presentations and so interesting, really. Relate, interestingly related to each other that I hope we'll all jump in. So my broad, my broadest question, which maybe you can each respond to, um, uh, is maybe it's time not to begin with Benedict Anderson. I, I'm struck by, uh, and I say this as I'm struck by how all the assumptions in, in his theorization of the relation of nationalism to the newspaper come from a post-syndication world. Uh, so, I, you know, if I could throw out uh, what might happen to our sense of nationalism or our sense of newspapers' relation to culture, if you could say a couple of words about that. If, if what if we rewrote Benedict Anderson, you know, from the inside out? Would would anything change that you think would be interesting or important? I mean, that idea of si the simultaneous reading of the exact same thing. Um, seems to be something yeah, that, that extends across a national sphere, seems something that, that actually requires syndication, which, which the 19th century newspaper takes a long time to get to. Um, but I, think, I, I think one thing that you can say is that what, what's compelling about the Anderson model is the notion that, um, that newspapers create communities, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, imagine, <coughs> imaginary ones, yeah. Imagine, well, imagine in the sense that, um, that, that the act of reading may be something that, that one does uh, uh, alone, although there's plenty of evidence that that's also not entirely true, um, but that that, that that act of reading allows you to have a sense of participating <coughs> in the community, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but it's the notion that that's a national community, which, mm -hmm. I, which I think is really an issue. So one of the things that was really cool about Hester's work, um, and also in relationship to Laura Cohen's work, is the idea that um, that, that the newspaper is, uh, that there's so little content that it is primarily aimed at this sort of social function, or, or creating the social function, and the fact that that it's not the content that drives it; it's the it's that social function that um, that works backward. But again, the issue <coughs> has to do with what's the shape of those communities, mm -hmm. and I think they vary enormously as you know as your work shows, and as your work shows, that how how is it that we can figure out what those communities <coughs> are, who they're participating, who's participating in? Those are really complex questions, mm -hmm. and that are not at all answered by the term nation. Right. <laughs> A, a lot of the, the Polar Expedition members um, have taken up the rhetoric of what the newspaper is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not uh, a universal, but you'll see a lot of references to um, obviously having a newspaper furthers the cause of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, or at one point, uh, the free press follows the flag and thus we have established mm -hmm. a press here in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. um, there's, an <clears throat> there's another one that says something about how um, uh, I'm not, not going to remember the details of that one, but so the, there's a very self-conscious taking up of some of the rhetoric of what 
in the mid 19th century a newspaper could ideally do. Mm -hmm. um, the actual execution of the newspapers, though, does not reflect the content of the cause of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't necessarily <laughs> reflect the free the free press because again, there's a lot of um, debating and internecine conflicts within these papers. Um, so I think that there's a, a real consciousness about what the uh, newspaper could promise as an organ of national thought, mm -hmm. that they are recognizing that in its actual function is has nothing to do with those loftier aims and more to do with imagining what would happen if there were romantic intrigues between the sled dogs, um, <laughs> which becomes entirely about the past, which is a big uh, uh, displacement narrative that happens on board the ship. Um, but but it, it, be, it, it always comes down to the actual details of that community's mm -hmm. own life um, and doesn't return to the lofty opening statement of the first issue of any given paper. Hester, I was just thinking about your example of the, the kind of violent exchange, too. And when I think about Benedict Anderson, it's always so much about the abstraction of citizenship through the newspaper. We don't think about specific bodies. And, and these were very specific bodies physically threatened through the newspaper. No, exactly, exactly. The, and the embodiment is, is very much just a function, too, of the location of the exceptionally close quarters, the inability to leave those quarters um, for more than 100 yards, um, and that long confinement in total darkness, I think, really produces an awareness of the physicality. We talked about materiality and immateriality yesterday. Mm. Um, and that circulation was so direct, and so there's nothing virtual about it. Um, so I think that that embodiment shows up in this. I, I will also say, uh, Abby's <coughs> Abby has discovered lots of instances of lots of quite a few instances of uh, editors coming to bodily harm mm -hmm. as a due, as due to their editorial activities, mm -hmm. which again mm -hmm. is embodied. Uh, I should start calling people. Yeah, mm -hmm. <coughs> um, just to to follow on this uh, critique of uh, synchronicity, I actually. Uh, Particularly through the first two presentations, I was thinking a lot of Jonathan's presentation yesterday, trying to think about how these newspapers also work as paper and how quickly they turn into paper from one thing to another. And even uh, while they're still current, uh, Laura, that, that cartouche that you showed where the man is reading the paper and this is you know, helping the family and then he's drinking and that's hurting the family. I was thinking also of Leah Price's uh, recent work talking about how the newspaper becomes this kind of cone of silence. Uh, that it, it's a way to, the man can screen him off by drinking or by reading, and it's better that he does it by reading. Um, so, you know, thinking of how that's not necessarily uplifting the family, it's just not hurting it. Mm -hmm. um, well, one of the most reprinted, heavily reprinted pieces that we have found is a, is a, um, a, a little sort of moral uh, narrative about how valuable it is for a father to read the newspaper at the breakfast table with his children. And that this is, this is sort of the, the whole basis of, um, of what it means to uh, create morality in your children, um, which, which we found really interesting, the, the newspaper promoting the newspaper within mm. the newspaper. <laughs> it's called the but influence the of a newspaper. And it, it purports to be an account from a school teacher talking about how his students that, whose families subscribe to a newspaper are so much smarter and so much more moral than his students yeah. from families that don't. So when you brought up that image, like, well, there's Elizabeth so and much I, material, yeah. right, of newspapers trumpeting themselves and uh, defining themselves in terms of, um, yeah, the the political imaginary. But I guess then it it's it's always strikes me how selective that is because there's so much material in these newspapers that you would not want to read to your children, your wife <laughs> at the breakfast table. And so much, um, you know, overtly divisive material. Uh, even the crime reporting, um, which uh, creates these um, kind of minstrel shows out of uh, reporting how people arrested talked and uses all this dialect and is, you know, clearly making a, a display, a, a comic display of um, criminality that in ways that are, you know, really creating insider outsider divisions and so you again if you're thinking about all the multiple readers um, and in terms of Anderson I mean there's 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 so many fractures mm -hmm. in any kind of imagined community that are being created um, by the newspaper I, I will say one thing that I've at least been struck by is I think looking at it at scale we've seen broader reach for individual text than we were expecting hmm. Which is to say, I think going into it, we thought there was going to be some real kind of regionality to the spread. 
and at least among the most widely spread, and perhaps that's the problem, that's the, that's the wrong example, um, they tend to stretch from New England out to Nebraska almost every time. And in fact, it, to, to such an extent that when they don't, it's, it's notable. So like, the one thing we have where I've seen a real like geographic difference is there's a speech that John Brown gives at his, um, at his sentencing. And first of all, I might have sort of said, I bet it doesn't get printed in the South, which is not true. We don't have a lot of Southern newspapers, but it does appear in our Southern newspapers. Where it does not appear is in any of the newspapers we have from Nebraska or Kansas. Um, and, and it's the only thing, in the most widely reprinted stuff we have, the only thing not reprinted in Nebraska and Kansas is that John Brown speech. And again, I, I'm hesitant to say that it was never printed because we don't have all the newspapers, but it, it was notable. It was interesting. Yeah, interesting. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is all. Of, this is just so fabulous. Thank you all. I was wondering about um, in the infectious text project. You know, get, get a map of what we're looking at right now up there. If there's a way that you could account for um, uh, habits of collecting and archiving, huh. um, because in some ways what we're looking at <laughs> is. I mean, maybe there was a fabulous newspaper storehouse in Nashville. You know what I mean? And so we have more papers from Nashville. Like, if there's there's a way, um, you know, that you could sort of account for collecting practices, mainly in the 20th century, of 19th century newspapers mm -hmm. that might affect your outcomes. I mean, it might be that we yeah. have... Because they're right. Because there's so much loss when it comes to 19th century newspapers, and and we know that there are um, places that we have more stuff from. Yeah. Um, um, and so, if there's any way to sort of like, and you know, and, and people can talk about that. You could run to provenance. You know, through getting provenance, you could you could you could find that data, and then it seems to me you could add it into um, your algorithm to then sort of account for that. Like yeah. what cities had devastating downtown fires right. in the 19th century. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, but the well, way to do that would be to just add another repository. So <laughs> do the AAS. Well, right? yes and no. Different. I mean, because uh, if there's a fire, neither LOC or AAS is going to right? So, right? so it, right. it gets better the more repositories you add, but you're still going to have dearth in the same, you know, I mean, we're all collecting from yeah. the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so what I should say, so the the Chronicling America collection is is actually not it's not one there's no one national newspaper digitization project. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's actually a, a collection of state level digitization projects. So states can apply to get funding to digitize their newspapers, and then they get aggregated through Chronicling America. And so what this means is that, as I tried to hint, we have some states we don't. There are entire states we don't have. Right? We don't have any newspapers from the state of Massachusetts. <laughs> Fortunately, Massachusetts is very unimportant in the 19th century. <laughs> Not a lot of printing going on there. Um, You're making me cry, Ryan. <laughs> but we don't because Massachusetts has not had a state-level open digitization mm -hmm. program. And in fact, Massachusetts newspapers are almost exclusively in commercial archives, mm -hmm. right? So we are right now, uh, we've made some headway with ProQuest in getting uh, their data. The problem is we don't need search access. I told you, search access doesn't get us what we need. We need the actual text data to do this kind of work. Uh, and we've made inroads with Redex, um, a few other companies that we're hoping to be able to incorporate. We're also about to incorporate some of the Making of America uh, journals mm -hmm. into the analysis. But, mm -hmm. but there are these huge holes, and, and we've talked a lot about trying to account for absence um, mm -hmm. in some meaningful way. Mm -hmm. uh, well, one of the things I've talked with Abby about, I don't know if it's ever going to be possible, is whether we can try and estimate how much reprinting is happening in the newspapers that we're not capturing. Because anytime you go into one of those images, you know, you, mm -hmm. you dig in and actually look at the text, on that very page are like four other reprinted things that we don't have, that we didn't capture. Right? Right. Because they're from a newspaper that we don't have, or for some other reason it wasn't captured. So mm -hmm. this is very and much on our Some of our, our clusters lines. are repeat clusters of other clusters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we need to like cluster our clusters. I, I will say, that, <laughs> I mean, just really briefly, I don't want to monopolize all this, but the stuff that we found does seem like a really good indicator. So yeah. we have done some experiments, like, oh, okay, here's something we found that was widely reprinted go to these other databases and do the manual search mm -hmm. for them, mm -hmm. and we almost always find a lot more. Mm -hmm. Which is to say, like I think that what we're finding is a pretty good indicative sample of what's in the mm -hmm. wider archive, but we, we know that there are you know, giant holes, as there would be 
in any archival research, mm -hmm. I think. And just briefly, I think this speaks to a larger question about the whole project of digitization that, um, that Jillian brought up in her paper yesterday, which is how do we represent absence? Right? Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a sense in digital projects that, that um, just having an archive, uh, it gives you some form of totality, and that's a, a very false uh, sense. And so the question is, even when you know that, how do you um, go about thinking about what is this? Right, I've got Lisa, Ed, and then someone in the back. Can you do it in that order? Great. Uh, uh, thanks, I just, you, you know, terrific panel, um, so much to think about. But uh, I guess I wanted to ask about this idea of newspapers as killing time, um, and, uh, you know, for some more detail in there. It struck me in particular about the shipboard newspapers. Um, that it's killing time in a very particular way in that case, that it's a kind of um, clean fun, um, that there's a kind of disciplinary uh, uh, motive there, um, the same way that there's a grog ration, um, say. Um, and particularly when you're sort of in this sort of intense homosocial world, but then doing theatricals. I mean, there's all kinds of flirtations on shipboard um, with the opposite. Um, and so it's a disciplinary rather than just the kind of killing time with my smartphone. Um, so, you know, for what it's worth, uh, you know, I just, that, that kind of struck me as something that maybe Laura and, and has to say a little bit more about. Thank you. The, um, <coughs> the presumptions that I brought to this project um, about the very terms that you're invoking, that some of which were upheld and some of which were shattered. Um, the, the killing time part is also about marking time. Um, this is a place where you cannot tell the time when you're in constant darkness. There's no difference between day and night. And this is where shipboard regulation becomes absolutely essential, that you maintain an hourly clock, that you maintain shifts, because you have to create time in the total absence of any other markers of it. And newspapers, of course, are periodic, but sh the Arctic newspapers are not. So if they want to be a weekly or a monthly, they start out in that their perfect calendrical ambitions, and then they start to drift they become more extenuated, and they all sort of peter out as spring becomes closer and they lose interest. So the way that they um, are marking time is very much an index of how the time itself cannot hold in the absence of any <coughs> geophysical ways to tell it. Um, but what I had assumed since my earlier work on sailor narratives, um, which you know are very racy and are really, um, and again, depending on how private or how public they were, um, reflect just how intimate and erotic the shipboard life can be, I assumed I would find this in the polar newspapers, and it is almost entirely absent, um, except for these sh these sled dog <laughs> narratives. And I couldn't figure out why that was until I realized, and I traditionally work in American literature, and a lot of these are on British ships. Mm. Um, what I had not realized, and any British naval historian would have known instantly, is that all British ships were required to turn over every piece of paper aboard ship to the Admiralty, mm -hmm. even before they hit port. Mm -hmm. And then the Admiralty would go through every piece of paper and then return them so that the captains or the mates could write up the journals. And so there are references to suppressed or destroyed newspapers mm -hmm. that don't make it back um, occasionally. And one can only imagine what the content might be. Um, but the result of this is that the, the record that we have from these British ships in particular um, is censored before the fact. Um, there's always an awareness that there's no, and this includes all private letters, all private journals, all correspondence. Um, there's a scandal at one point where a ship's doctor is thought to have kept a secret diary um, that he, but it turns out he just kept it secretly because he wants to print it before any of the other um, expedition materials come out so he doesn't have to go through the Admiralty's clearinghouse. And so his comes out like four days after they get mm. back on land. Um, but again, it's, there, there's an awareness that in the clean fun that's, being, that's happening in the actual structure of this production, that there's always an awareness that there is an audience for these newspapers, even as, even within the pages of them themselves, um, that awareness falls away. Mm. Uh, I don't. I don't know exactly what to add, but I guess um, this this periodicity issue with newspapers means there's a kind of a ritual associated, or a desired ritual kind of tried to be imposed on on readers. Um, and then I guess that reminds me of the just the many different ways that we read, which is always interesting to talk about with students as well. I mean, so there's the skimming, and then there's the um, uh, 
then there's reading for information, then there's reading for education or engagement or enragement or whatever we, we, might, we might be doing. And it seems that in any one newspaper, you read in many ways, which is still the, the case. Um, and that that's interesting to talk about and that you slow it down or speed it up partly de depending on how much time you have. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know, I would like to think more about that. But. One of the things I loved about this panel and the way it was set up is you've got um, you know, Hester and Laura that are doing the archival work one-on-one, -on -one, the scholar with the object, and then Elizabeth and Ryan working with uh, the large scale. My question is, what would uh, something in the middle be like, like middling sized data, not mm. big data? Mm. And, and I'll give a couple examples of what I'm thinking of, and then I want to ask all of you, like, how, how might that model of scale help you, or what would you, what kind of digital tools or analog methods could help? Um, one thing I'm thinking of is uh, Stephanie Blaylock, a, a Whitman scholar, who just found um, over 250 reprints of Whitman's early fiction. And she did it with a um, kind of an analog workaround to similar to what you guys are doing, except she would just go to search engines and she would type in phrases from Whitman's um, early fiction and, and, and get results that would say by an author or by WW, mm -hmm. things that we didn't know about. So doing what your algorithm was doing, but manually. Um, so, and that's, again, it's kind of a middling sized data. She knew exactly what she was looking for with the reprints. Um, or, or even like the, the clusters that you guys found. What would it be like to drill down into Nashville and just to take that smaller data set? Um, so I guess those, that's my question. What is, what is right in the middle of you guys? What does that look like and what use could it be or what tools could we develop to help you deal with those problems? I mean, the methodology you're describing is where I started with Hawthorne, right? which is I had the text that I wanted and I was just leveraging search function, basically, to, to find more than had been found. Um, in some ways, I mean, that kind of work that you're talking about is what I hope people will do with this, mm -hmm. which is to say we're trying to generate this resource, <coughs> and, and I and Elizabeth, <laughs> we're not going to have any chance of actually sort of using everything <laughs> that we're generating. Um, and so one of the reasons why we want to make all this public um, and we're providing an API so more technical people can do technical mm. things with the data and you know there's the search function and a sort of you know, almost like a, in a library you can sort of you know save clusters that you find interesting to come back to late you know to export the results um, we're hoping that a lot of work will be done by scholars with this data that might be at exactly the, the place that you're talking about and also just just to say um, looking at the data that we have so Every time you go to a particular reprint, it turns out that there's a, a story behind the story, right? So the first, when you get the reprint, then, then the question you have to ask is kind of the one that you're asking, which is how do I, how do I read this? And um, first of all, what are they talking about? Like, what is gum Arabic starch anyway? Or, you know, it's, it, so, so you sort of have to get your mind around it. So, and then start thinking about um, and going through the instances and so forth. And, and it often happens that there's a very rich story involved in thinking through that, that <coughs> particular reprint. So, so all I would say is emphasize that, that the, the, the necessity for the simultaneity of distant reading and close reading, that, that, that it's bringing those two things together that gets exciting about having this information that you can then drill down into. If I could jump in too, I, I, I wonder if there's any plan, any, any crazy person just like you guys who would do this for um, magazines that have a, a slower periodicity. Um, that, you know, we're, we're in a kind of sublime scenario here, which is part of what makes this project so exciting. Um, but as you move up uh, into the weekly and the monthly, you get a higher proportion of, of quote unquote literary texts uh, and a smaller data set. And it would be very interesting not only to think about um, reprinting across um, uh, different kinds of periodicals, but uh, I, I wonder if the, the literary target might come into a sharper view, you know, with a with a different set of objects. Although I think, in a way, the literary target does come into sharp view with just to, just because uh, you see that so much of what is being reprinted is quasi literary right. anyway, right? And moving down the scale. And, uh, and then you know, I love this idea about the sort of flatness of reprinting, and then trying to think as the next stage, as you're saying, look for places where there's comments on why mm. something was reprinted, and uh, try and determine directionality to some extent. So, you, which you sometimes can do by some papers saying this comes from mm -hmm. the Pittsburgh Examiner and you could you know start looking at directions of trajectories and something that interests me a lot is what are the 
um, hinterland papers in a sense giving in exchange mm -hmm. to the metropolitan papers can we learn something about that like what's in it for both sides and the relationship between rural papers and city papers mm -hmm. um, so I think I mean, the, the literary exchanges are fascinating and just reminding us how essential that was perceived to be mm. as part of what a newspaper did, right. um, even though they're not yeah, authored necessarily mm. and so on. So there's lots of possibilities there. I'm pretty excited about it. So the very next data that we're adding is the Making of America Journals and Oh, fantastic. Magazines. Fantastic. So we're, we're very they're interested in there. thinking about magazine culture as well, and maybe eventually even trying to get a hold of like you know, the Google Books Corpus and trying mm -hmm. to loop it in as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, That'd be but, fantastic. I mean, I, I'm happy for this to get as big as it wants to get so that it will enable lots of different kinds of research to come out of it. Um, but So what you were saying, you're, you're getting in a lot of the questions that are sort of most enticing to us right now. Um, one of the things that one of that um, one of the RAs is doing is just going into the clusters and trying to just flag whenever there's any kind of commentary. Mm. Because the, the algorithm doesn't capture that. It only captures the matching text. It doesn't capture any unique text that's mm. above or below. Mm -hmm. the Which they're often matching is. Text. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because it, that's not what it's looking for, right? Mm. The computer is good at finding patterns. It's not good at finding the exceptions to the patterns. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, one of the things that uh, he's doing is just going in and not even commenting yet, but just if there is any kind of editorial preface, he's flagging it so that we can go back and mm. look at it more closely down the road. That's great. Yeah. There's someone in the back who had his hand up quite early. Yeah. Oh, yes, thank you. So I guess I wanted to ask you guys, thank you for the stimulating panel. That was great. I wanted to ask you guys about um, the category of the newspaper. Um, I mean, uh, I have an embarrassing confession to make, Elizabeth. I, I actually read the paper with my sons at the breakfast. <laughs> but I read They're going it to do well in school, Jim. <laughs> I read it online. Yeah. So I was reminded, Laura, when you were saying that the Canadian court said that papers put online are not newspapers? No, they are. It's just a, a, a co uh, co collected uh, archive that is not a newspaper. So, like, if you took uh, the whole New York Times uh, as an archive, all its issues, that's not, that's not in itself a newspaper. Is an online newspaper a paper? I guess that's my fundamental question. Mm. Does it, does because, I, I wonder again then about Benedict Anderson, right? Does it work in the same way? The periodicity is mm. different. It's not really daily. In some cases, it's every minute. Um, your material relationship to it is different. Its circulation is different. I mean, it seems like that changes the, the, the communities that papers can imagine. And I'm not sure if it's the same thing, whatever that would mean. So I, I just wondered if you guys could comment on the category of the newspaper in relation to this new digital media. I know it's not the 19th century, <laughs> but it seems like that might help us understand the earlier forms of this media and extend uh, ideas about the materiality of the paper and our relationship affective material and otherwise to it? To be, uh, just very quickly, to be anachronistic, but this is something that I say, especially talking to students, uh, the hybridity of the 19th century newspaper looks and reads to me a lot more like a website that aggregates content from all over the place mm. than it looks and reads like a newspaper from uh, 1995 or today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I actually, when I look at that newspaper with all the different kinds of stuff that's there, it reminds me a lot of like you know why we turn to our Facebook feed today, which is to get news and entertainment and to hear a song with the music video. Uh, it's not a perfect analogy, but in some ways I feel like we're almost sort of returning <laughs> to an older form when we go to that web page that has all these different kinds of stuff in the same on the same screen. I would absolutely agree with that. We, we've trained ourselves now, those of us who read newspapers electronically, there are banner ads that mm. frame the newspaper. We don't see them anymore, right? Our eye knows where to go on the home page of a newspaper. Uh, but the 19th century newspapers are entirely framed by advertising. <coughs> and those of us who have worked with those newspapers know to look that it's usually on page four that the news might come in. It's because it's standing tight. It, it, exactly. And so the, the, uh, you know, for that. Exactly, yeah. and and in a similar fashion, the way that we are reading habits train us, and this is those of us who have been reading um, things online for some years. Those structures change the place where you look. We know to look in a print newspaper 
the upper right is where the top story is. That's not necessarily the case on web page news stories. So you just get retrained in the framing that's always going to happen. But I would absolutely agree with what Brian said there. And it, I also I also read the, uh, especially when I'm traveling, I read um, the, I look at the times most, um, most forwarded uh, mm -hmm. or most read. Mm -hmm. so, there, mm -hmm. so there's a way in which um, the, re <laughs> the reprinting that yes. actually mm -hmm. occurs on my iPhone as well. And so I can see, you know, what has been most often emailed to other people. So there's a, so the, the ways in which the news is, is sliced or packaged or prepackaged for me to mm -hmm. consume mm -hmm. actually has a reprinting algorithm in there yeah. already, yeah. which is sort of interesting. And that's different from syndication. Right, that yeah. has more to do with people email. Absolutely, right? very much. As opposed to we have a formal relationship with this company, and so we, we print all their stories. Mm -hmm. In the middle, there's a question. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Um, this is a follow-up on what just been said. I'm wondering, particularly from uh, Ryan and Elizabeth and uh, Laura, to talk a little bit more about the information architecture. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things I noticed in the slides is, and Hester, you're sort of getting at this, where we look, how we see the news, and those earlier newspapers, it's almost this dense, technical density of information uh, of which there have to then, nothing is particularly organized, at least from a, maybe a 21st century, and you move to where images start to occur and begin to organize the, the news. So I guess the <coughs> of this question is there's a reprinting of content that's going on. Does that content always appear in the same place? Uh, not everyone's reading the newspaper or all of it at the same time. Is there a way to locate whether it's appearing? Like, is there a formula or a genre? You said it has to on the sides where the advertisements occur. Are, uh, you know, does certain, uh, does the literature appear on page one in the earlier part? Does it disappear entirely in the later part? Is there a way we can get a sense of how the newspaper in its modern, in, its, in our sense of, right, the USA Today version of barely, uh, you know, image-driven, hierarchically organized, Right, taglines, headlines, that kind of thing that's missing. Can we get a sense of that through this kind of data search of where the news is occurring, how it's occurring? Is there any well, I would say there's there's variation, uh, but if you read the same paper all the time, mm -hmm. you would yeah. see how it worked in that paper. And generally, you know, so that it's it's one sheet, right? And the when it's folded, the, the fourth page, the back, is all always all ads. Maybe the shipping news might be put off to there, but you know, so that's where the patent medicines are, and uh, you know, it's usually about twenty-five percent of a newspaper, right? Unless, <laughs> unless on the third page, which there are some newspapers, yeah. and then the back page is more like the more current stuff. Current stuff, uh, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Um, and the editorial material is often on the inside of the second page, mm -hmm. and there's often a poem on the first page, or maybe the poems on the last page. But so there's there's variation, but each paper has a certain logic to it. It isn't as mysterious once you've read a few issues, right, as, as it would be with our modern technology. That does, I mean, I mentioned this before, but that does, correct me if I'm wrong, print historians, that has to do with the parts of the paper that are left in standing type, mm -hmm. that don't need to be reset, the hugely expensive part of the production, uh, versus the things including the poems that can often be uh, um, used to fill out the page. So there's a, it's information architecture, but it's not abstract. It actually has to do with the material mm -hmm. uh, requirements of production. And the advertisements are often repeated, um, you know, for a long right. period of time. Because you buy them for and three so months. Not, right. So they're not reset. Right. right. They're kept in the same. So they're, they're, it, it's kind of like a, when you go to a different grocery store, you have to, like, refigure out. And I think it's similar for the newspaper. Like, you learn how to read one yeah. paper, and then it's slightly different for another paper. I'm told we have to break with information <laughs> architecture hanging. <laughs> um, I'm sure we'll have a chance to come back to this, but I want to thank the panelists for a really truly <laughs>